So, I had the challenge of a graveyard stop just after lunch, and I'm going to talk about economics. I <laughs> promise I'll be quick, and I'm not going to, um, hopefully, not going to pull you all to uh, somnolence. So, um, just, to, oops, just to say a little bit about what pro bono economics do. We match professional economists with charities, and they provide pro bono help to measure performance and understand charity impact. And the other thing we're trying to do is to foster that culture of volunteering in our profession, which is not best known for its um, uh, uh, out, outgoingness, if you like. Um, and so Andy Chain um, got in touch with me as part of uh, his work with NCDA and said, would we be interested in providing some volunteers to help with the, um, the work that was being done? And I just happened to have uh, three volunteers in Sussex University who got very excited about the idea that they could work with the local project. Now, I'm not actually going to talk to you about the detail of that project. They have just this morning <coughs> submitted a draft report, but the work that they've been doing has been actually a little bit upstream from doing a cost-benefit analysis. They have been working with NCDA about the sort of information and data they need to collect and embedding that into systems in order to do that value-for-money work once the information is there. So I'm going to talk um, about what makes cost-benefit analysis work in, in general? So just a few pointers about what I think are the ingredients uh, that make a cost-benefit analysis uh, useful and, and a sensible thing to do. So the first thing is, you're putting a pound sign on anything is only as good as the underlying numbers, the impact that, you're, that you are looking at, the change that you think you have made. And the first step for that is clearly to measure outcomes um, I'm pretty obsessed about the, the counterfactual, really understanding what would have happened if you didn't do what you're doing. What would have happened anyway? And for me, impact is therefore outcomes minus the counterfactual. So it's the additional bit that you have achieved through your intervention that wouldn't have happened unless you got involved. And I just want to stress that is an estimate. A measurement <coughs> minus an estimate is an estimate. It's not certain, it's not definite. You don't know what would have happened anymore. That's the whole point. So there is always a degree of uncertainty. And, and for me, again, not a, a, a characteristic economist uh, particularly known for, we have, to be, we have to have a bit of humility about our results. We are not talking about truth. We are talking about our best estimate of, of what has happened. And that's what we're trying to put a value on. So just a very quick word about control groups, because um, it, it was mentioned earlier in the day. Um, there are all sorts of ways of doing this, and I'm certainly not one to say, unless you've got a randomised control trial, that's the only way you can think about what would have happened anyway. In some cases, you may have a client group who are very representative of the national average, and there may be national average data that you can use as a, as a way of a comparison. And we did a piece for Foundation Training Company, working with um, ex-offenders, and we used the national average with a very careful explanation of why that may not have been a perfect control group, so perfectly open about, you know, there are issues, but sometimes you can do that. Sometimes you can do it before and after. So we did some work with Making Every Adult Matter Coalition, working with adults, multiple needs, and the most entrenched needs. All the people selected onto these pilots had had problems for years and years and years, and, and I've got the numbers of how many years in each case is. So we felt that in that case, before and after, okay, there's a very good chance that if somebody has had multiple problems for 10 years and they enroll on a pilot and something changes, that it is something to do with the pilot. You may be able to match your records in an administrative data set, so um, many of you will have heard about the Peterborough Social Impact Bond, um, and that is using <coughs> Ministry of Justice data, and the Ministry of Justice now have a data lab, which allows you not only to find out about the, the offending history of your own beneficiaries, but also of a match control group. So that's another way of doing it. There may be some kind of natural experiment in, actually in the data. So we did a piece for Bernardo's, who work with uh, young people at risk of sexual, sexual exploitation. And what our team found was that in the data, two neighboring boroughs were uh, referring young people at different ages. So one borough at 14 years old and one borough at 15 years old nothing to do with their risk factors, nothing to do with the things we were worried about, that was simply the policy. And so they used that to say, well, if, if Bernardo's didn't intervene, what might have happened to those young people by looking at the difference between the 14-year-olds in one borough 
and the 15 year olds in the number. So that's another way of doing it. And lastly, the, the famous randomized control trials. So lots of people very <coughs> keen to uh, promote that, and that is a good way sometimes of, of getting hold of that, what would have happened anyway, but it's not the only way. When you're doing a cost-benefit analysis, and this is where it's important that you know the economists don't just kind of parachute in and say, right, this is how to do it. You need to be thinking about whose perspective are you interested in? Are you wanting to show that this is creating some sort of value for the whole of society in general? If you are, you won't be including things like tax and benefits because that's just money shifting around between different members of society. So that, that's kind of not relevant to the, to the, to the pound sign you have at the end. But a lot of people want to make a case that they are saving the taxpayer money or, or creating some benefit to the public purse. So if you're thinking about benefits then to the exchequer, you want to know have taxes gone up, have benefits gone down, if there are other public service costs that have been avoided. But you've got to be very careful that those numbers really are about cashable savings or are they just some well, in an ideal world, if my program was so successful that we could shut down an entire prison, then we'd make a real saving. But actually, the program might be working with very small numbers, just making marginal changes that aren't going to mean that services are decommissioned. So again, being very clear about what we are and aren't doing. Or, is the thing that we're most interested in, the value to the individuals who are on the program. And then you will be interested in things like, have they lost benefits, have they got more benefits, jobs and what income. So being very clear about what, what it is you want the cost-benefit analysis for, what sort of level you're working at. What benefits do you want to include? Now mostly what we economists have been at is sticking pound signs on hard outcomes. That's, that's what we do. So qualifications which lead to employment, which lead to lifetime earnings, lifetime earnings, that's a number with a pound sign. We can do that. We can also do the stuff around costs avoided. Uh, run by through a different use of public services, either not using them or, or going from, say, expensive emergency service use to less expensive routine visits to the GP. We're not so good at the stuff around soft outcomes. And I think we have to, again, be very honest about that. There is some early work being done um, with some of the big well-being services <coughs> that are now <coughs> um, being run by ONS. But it's in, it's in the very early stages. It's related to income, so looking at... Uh, and so therefore it's only useful for people who are early, not for kids, not for people who haven't got jobs. I will just mention SROI because it's a social return on investment because it was um, uh, mentioned this morning. I mean, that's, that's a way of trying to put value on things which don't have an obvious value by asking stakeholders what they think, what would be a good proxy. That is... That, that is a way of coming up with a value. It does mean that you can have two charities doing exactly the same intervention with the same sort of outcomes and the stakeholders have different ideas about what those proxies should be. And they can be very different in terms of the numbers that you get. So you know, there are some issues around that as well. Anyway, on the cost side, that can be just as tricky. What costs are we thinking about? Is it just the cost of a particular program? How do we put a value on volunteer input? Is it valued at the job they do uh, for the intervention, or is it the value of the job they do in their day job? So if you've got a lawyer helping a young person, is that really worth more than a uh, somebody who works at Tills and Sainsbury's working to help working with a young person? So there's lots of issues you've got to think about there. And what do you do about all your support activities? So if you're uh, delivering an intervention, you do a lot of campaigning and advocacy. Is that part of the cost of delivering the intervention or not? And these are all questions that only the organisations who are delivering the interventions can really answer. You know, there aren't right or wrong answers. It's conversations about you know, what do you want to do, what should be in, what should be out. And then when you're talking about the value of the benefits, back to this idea of you know, can you shut down a whole a pupil referral unit because you, you've kept people young people in school, are you talking about average costs? Or are you just talking about the marginal cost of one extra young person in the pupil referral unit? Those numbers are very different. And so again, it's just being very clear what's in, what's out, what's being included, what's not being included. And our um, position at, M uh, at PBE is that you know, we want anybody to look at one of our reports and be able to work out you know, what we've chosen, why, what, what's in there, what are the assumptions? 
where we've had to make assumptions. Is there evidence for that or is it our best guess? And often it is our best guess, but we just can't say. Nobody knows, we don't, so we guess, we made the assumption, it's this. So that was your whistle stop tour through what makes a good cost benefit analysis. My conversation starters are, when do I need one? I'm not here to say that everybody should do a cost benefit analysis of everything they do. I, I really don't believe that. But there are times when it can be useful and helpful. And what are the practical challenges? Because I think that um, the MCDA staff will, will acknowledge that it's not, it's not straightforward talking to economists always. And it's not, it's not necessarily a straightforward thing to get the data, but something, you know, what do people think of the practical challenges around being able to do this sort of work? Yeah. 